I've got to start uh, with the markets today, Mr. President. Uh, you've heard uh, over the last few minutes of where we are today, back down again. A lot of people are saying this is the Fed's fault. What do you make of what's been going on in markets lately? Well, uh, I'll avoid in this position commenting too much on market changes other than to say uh, some amount of volatility in the markets and up and down I think is typical. The, the one thing I would comment on is I watch earnings reports and I talk to about 30 CEOs a month and I think the story is consistent. Input costs are higher across the board, labor, materials, steel, aluminum, and I think companies are struggling for whether they can pass those increases on in price increases or whether they're facing margin erosion. And I see in the corporate earnings reports very consistent story from what I'm hearing from companies. Well, is there a level change, a percent move, or something that would cause you to believe that maybe the Fed should slow down, take a pause, not move in December? What I'm looking for is what impact uh, and what this all indicates about the strength of the underlying economy. And, and also the impact on financial conditions. So it's not a market move up or down per se. It's, it's still uh, what is my outlook for the economy and what is my assessment of financial conditions uh, in the economy that might impact uh, future growth prospects. Well, if it's not you, if it's not the Fed, uh, some say it is a weaker outlook for growth, particularly with earnings going into 2019. A view that uh, yesterday new Vice Chairman Rich Clarida seemed to disagree with in his speech. Uh, have you changed your forecast in any way up or down going into 2019? So, Mike, as you know from our previous conversations, all year this year I've been saying 2018 was going to be a very strong year. We've got a substantial amount of fiscal stimulus, not just a tax agreement, but also the budget bill, which increased government spending. And we've been forecasting all year that 2019 growth would be weaker than 2018 and that 2020 would be a little bit weaker still as fiscal stimulus wears off. And we still got this headwind of an aging population and slowing workforce growth. So my, my outlook is pretty consistent, but I've been expecting some moderation of growth because I've been believing that the fiscal stimulus is going to wane as we head to the end of this year and into next year. One of the other big stories people have been talking about is, of course, Donald Trump's criticisms of Jay Powell and the Fed. Janet Yellen, very strong in the Financial Times today, saying uh, Trump does have the potential to undermine the Fed. How much should we worry about that? So uh, I think people outside the Fed, uh, as appropriate, should be or feel free to comment on this. I think in my position, I won't comment on it uh, other than to say my job is to do uh, economic analysis and make judgments on monetary policy without regard to political considerations or political influence. And I think criticism comes with the territory. So I think my mission uh, and our mission at the Fed is the same. Well, are you being set up for, uh, to be the fall guy for uh, any kind of economic shortfall? So, so I, I think it's very important that I not worry about that. Uh, I, I think we're in a very challenging situation that you and I have talked about before. We've got uh, healthy growth in the United States, but fiscal stimulus is part of that growth. Uh, it's going to wane in 19 and 20. And the, and the trick is how to get the judgment and the balance right uh, between moving toward a neutral stance, but avoiding being predetermined or rigid in, in where th what that destination ultimately is and the pace of it. And so I think that's still the challenge, and that's, a, that's complicated enough with wor without me worrying about other extraneous factors. Well, let's talk about the Beige Book. Suggests a lot of concern about tariffs in the American business. Yeah. Uh, what impact are you seeing or forecasting? So it's unusual for me to talk to a CEO that has not seen cost increases pretty much across the board. Labor costs, materials, uh, it's, it's typical. The only question CEOs have is, is can they pass those increases on in terms of prices. In some industries, they are doing that. In other industries, given the dynamics of the industry, they can't. And I think the beige book is very consistent 
And so that's why if the tariff situation intensifies, my guess is input cost pressures are going to intensify also. Uh, and it's not having a big effect on headline GDP growth, but it's having a very big effect on companies and industries and their ability to manage uh, their costs. Well, can companies in your district raise prices? Depends on the industry. Uh, in certain industries, they can, and, a, and in particular, if it's a consumer-facing industry, uh, they may not have pricing power, and they, they may suffer margin erosion, and there's a whole range of consumer-facing industries, including, by the way, the home builders, who really aren't able, effectively, they're finding to pass on cost increases, and they're either going to see... Uh, uh, volume declines because of sticker shock on the part of the consumer, or they're going to have to find a way to, to moderate their costs because they just don't have pricing power. We're getting closer to the neutral rate. You've pegged it at like about 275 to 3 uh, percent. How close are you to possibly making a policy mistake? So I, I've said that uh, the estimate of the neutral rate, it's a concept. It's imprecise. It's uncertain. It's part of the mosaic I look at, and I've said it could be, it could be two and a half to three, two and three quarters. It could be two and three quarters to three. I'm going to have to make that judgment over the next year as as uh, the economy unfolds. But to your point, uh, I'm very sensitive uh, to not being rigid or predetermined about the pace at which we get there, and the reason is again. I expect GDP growth in 2018 to be strong, but I expect it to moderate as this fiscal stimulus starts to wane in 19 and 20, and we've still got to deal with the headwinds of slowing workforce growth due to aging and sluggish productivity. So I think getting this balance right is going to require me to keep an open mind, not be too predetermined or prejudged. And, uh, and so I think that's the challenge of this. And, uh, and so we'll have to make these judgments, and I will make these judgments as we head along this path. Well, speaking of judgments, effective Fed funds are again trading at the top of their range, right at IOER right now, as they were in June. Uh, how much of a problem is that? And do you anticipate we will see in November or in December an adjustment to the IOER rate? So we'll have to see. Uh, it's always possible we'll have to make more technical adjustments. And part of what we're judging as we wind down the balance sheet is what is the demand for reserves in the banking system and in the economy. And, uh, and, and I think we're going to have to be open-minded to learning from this. There's no textbook on how you normalize interest rate policy uh, and wind down a balance sheet. And so I think it's critical to be open to learning and I think we're doing that right here. And so it's possible we'll have to make more technical adjustments in the months ahead. W would that be something that could be done in November? Uh, we, we don't expect any kind of rate move because it's a non-press conference meeting. But something like that, would you feel free to approve uh, an IOER adjustment? I, I don't want to prejudge what we're going to do. But I, I think it's one of, one of the things that, yeah, I, I, I think it's important to keep an open mind in each meeting about uh, about addressing this if it needs to be addressed. No Fed district uh, more closely tied to Mexico than yours. You are in Mexico City. Yeah. Give us a, a feel for what you think about uh, the incoming Mexican administration. What are you expecting in the economic relationship between the two countries? Well, uh, on the positive side, uh, I think it's been important for the United States and for both countries, for Mexico and the United States, to move forward getting an, uh, uh, the trade agreements in this hemisphere updated and resolved. And I think it removes an enormous uncertainty. But it also, and from our research at the Dallas Fed, improves U.S. competitiveness and allows us to add U.S. jobs. And so we're glad that's getting done. That's good for both countries. There's a lot of uncertainty about the privatization and modernization of this country and a lot of the reforms that have been done over the last five years. And I think the jury's still out as to whether those reforms will continue or whether they'll be put on hold or slow down. And that's the part we don't know. Uh, NAFTA 2.0, going to change anything? Uh, it'll, it'll create some changes. I think the most important thing about NAFTA 2.0 or the North American 
uh, trade agreement is that it's, it, that it's going to get resolved. Uh, I think you could quibble about certain provisions, whether it's going to help improve U.S. competitiveness and our global competitiveness. But I think the most important headline is that removing the uncertainty is good for the United States and it's good for uh, Mexico. We talked about input costs uh, and global competitiveness. Getting this agreement done is important to the United States because 70 percent of the imports from Mexico are intermediate goods, part of integrated supply chains and logistic arrangements that we think make the U.S. more competitive and allow the U.S. to add jobs. And so that part's the critical part. Back to rates for a moment. We have a, a question from a viewer. I, I wasn't strong enough in asking you about a potential pause. When you look at the interest rate sectors of the economy, autos and particularly housing and the impacts of uh, higher rates and even the lack of uh, tax deductions uh, in the high tax states, does that lead you to think maybe you've gone too far or you're getting really close to it? No. Listen, I watch housing very carefully, and I talk to home builders. We have a number in our district, and a, couple of, a number of national home builders do a lot of business in Texas because it's growing so fast. And you may know, uh, and we've been watching this closely at the Dallas Fed, new home sales in Dallas and Houston, which are two of the fastest-growing cities in the United States, new home sales have been sluggish. And, in fact, they've been weak. And so we're doing a lot of work at our district trying to understand how that slowing fits in with overall economic growth. And one of the conclusions I would come to is there's a, there's a, there, the input costs, labor shortages, higher input costs, and yes, higher mortgage rates are all part of the story. And so uh, we're watching this carefully. It's been weak for the last three months. Uh, I'm not ready to say that it's an indicator of, the, of uh, weakening in the economy, but I can tell you we're watching it very carefully. And again, it comes in the context of my own base case expectation that growth was going to weaken as we headed into 2019. So I'm just watching what this tells us, if anything, about, uh, about the, the trend in GDP growth. Uh, new Vice Chair Clarida is going to head yet another Fed subcommittee on communication. What can we expect? What's wrong with the way you communicate now, and how would you fix it? Well, I'm a, and I'm on that subcommittee uh, uh, with uh, Vice Chair Clarida. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't put it that there's something wrong. I think a good organization is constantly re-reviewing its communications, its frameworks, uh, the way it operates. I think that's healthy. Uh, and I think, uh, I think the Fed is moving toward doing that, and I would hope doing it on some regular basis. And, and I think that's wise. And as an, as, an, as an institution where it's critical that we keep our independence, I think part of keeping your independence is earning it by revisiting the way you conduct yourself, including communication and your frameworks. So I think us doing that is a good thing. Well, speaking of communication, in her FT interview, Janet Yellen talks about how there was internal dissent in the Open Market Committee over QE, a group calling itself the Three Amigos, which included Jay Powell, uh, worried that it would trigger financial instability. How united is the committee now on the policy path that now Chairman Powell has set? So there's debate around the committee, and I hope there will be debate. I think debate and disagreement is one of the things I've been very impressed by at the Federal Open Market Committee. And, and I, I don't think you want a situation where we all ag agree completely. Uh, and, w and we've got uh, a number of us, I'll, I'll speak for myself, believe that we should be gradually and patiently moving toward a more neutral stance, meaning we don't need to have our foot on the accelerator. But not everybody agrees with that, and there's a lot of disagreement as to the pace and where neutral is. And I think that disagreement is healthy. And when I go to an FOMC meeting, I state my case and my arguments, but I listen very carefully to the others around the table. And, uh, and I'm open to being persuaded and changing my views. And I think that's a good dynamic, and I hope it continues.